<laughs> Hello and welcome to Veterans Metals Workshop. We're really glad you're here today because we're starting an entirely new series. We're going to take a look at all of the military medals of the United States starting with the Revolution in 1776 up through 1790. And then we'll take a look from 1812 up to the Civil War, from the Civil War up to the First World War, and then all the way to the Global War on Terror. But those will be other series. Today we're going to look at, well, you're not going to see a lot of medals, but you're going to see the most beautiful medals ever created for United States military members. There are only 11 awarded by Congress during the Revolution, along with three special medals awarded to the men who captured Major Andre, and we'll look at that Fidelity Medal, and we'll take a look at the three sergeants who received the first Purple Heart, and then we'll take a look at, well, each individual gold or silver medal that was awarded by Congress to the heroes of the Revolution. And you'll also get to see the special victory medal. It was designed by Benjamin Franklin and created by the royal engraver to the King of France. <laughs> it's a nice little touch. So I think you'll enjoy this. I don't think you'll see this anywhere else on YouTube. So sit back and take a nice look at some great American history, starting with the medals of the Revolution. While the beginning of military awards can be traced to the ancient Egyptians and the Greeks, it was the Roman legions who first organized an award system honoring their soldiers for bravery and service. Once recognized, Roman soldiers wore these decorations in battle, in parades, and displayed them in their homes after their military service. If an entire Roman legion was cited for valor, a decoration was added to the legion's eagle standards. The American Revolution lasted over seven years, from April 1776 to September 1783. Congress authorized 11 gold and silver medals for seven key battles during the Revolution, and the manufacturing of them was led by none other than Thomas Jefferson, Colonel David Humphreys, and Benjamin Franklin. The first Congressional Gold Medal was presented to General Washington for his victory over the British in Boston. The front of the medal is inscribed as follows. The American Congress to George Washington, Commander-in-Chief of the Armies, the Asserter of Liberty, and as an undraped bust of General Washington facing to the right. The reverse of the medal is described as followed. The enemy put to flight for the first time, and to the left, General Washington on horseback, surrounded by his staff, points towards the British fleet, which is leaving Boston. The American army, in battle array in front of its entrenchments, makes ready to occupy the city of Boston. And at the very bottom in Latin, it reads, Boston retaken, March 17, 1776. Oh, and on the cannon is the mark of the royal engraver of the French king, Duvet. Here's a current example of General Washington's medal in bronze and a presentation box from the United States Treasury. Usually there are examples in silver and pewter available for collectors. When General Washington passed away, it's interesting to note when they opened his lockbox, there were three medals in there. His Congressional Gold Medal his gold eagle for the Order of Cincinnati, shown in the frame, and a diamond, ruby, and emerald-encrusted Order of Cincinnati presented to him by the French Navy. The second gold medal awarded by Congress was to Major General Horatio Gates for his victory at Saratoga, which was a turning point in the war. One thing General Gates did that was unusual is he had a ring put in the top of his medal and then wore it around the neck on his uniform, as shown in the portrait to the upper right. In front of the medal is inscribed, The American Congress to Horatio Gates, a Valiant General. And it has a bust of General Gates in uniform facing to the left. The reverse of the medal is inscribed as The Safety of the Northern Regions. And it shows Lieutenant General Burgoyne as surrendering his sword to General Gates. Of course, that didn't actually happen. Burgoyne sent one of his subordinates to present the sword. But in the background on the left of the vanquished troops of Great Britain, grounding their arms and standards, and on the right is the victorious American army, in order of battle with colors flying. And the inscription reads in Latin, The enemy surrendered at Saratoga, on the 17th of October, 1777. The recapture of the Stony Point fortification on the Hudson River 
was a major victory in 1779 for the Continental Light Infantry under the command of Brigadier General Mad Anthony Wayne. General Wayne's medal celebrates his leadership assaulting Stony Point in July 15, 1779. It was a stunning victory with the capture of over 500 British soldiers, and the Battle of Stony Point proved a big boost to American morale and one of the final battles for the American independence in the North. He personally led his men under cover of night in an attack which lasted only 30 minutes. And, while wounded, he insisted his officers carry him to the front of the assault. General Wayne received a gold medal engraved by Nicholas Marie Gasso in 1789. The medal depicted America, personified as an Indian queen, standing and having at her feet a bow, an alligator, and an American shield, presenting General Wayne a laurel and mural crown, and the reverse of the medal pictures the Battle of Stony Point. Collectors can often find bronze, silver, and pewter variations of the General Anthony Wayne Medal as shown here. Lieutenant Colonel de Fleury was a former French officer chosen by General Wayne to lead one of the two columns in the assault on Stony Point. The Frenchman was the first man over the walls, leading his men with only bayonets and personally cut down the British colors. His unfailing courage and brilliant execution earned him a silver congressional medal. His silver medal, inscribed in Latin, reads, A Memorial and Reward of Courage and Boldness and it shows him as a Roman soldier, helmeted, standing amidst the ruins of a fort, holding in his right hand a sword, and his left the staff of an enemy's flag, which he trampled under his right foot. The bottom is inscribed, The American Republic presents this gift to Monsieur de Fleur, a French knight, the first to mount the walls. The back of the medal is a really handsome presentation of Stony Point. It shows the fortress of Stony Point with six vessels on the Hudson River. In the top of it reads, Fortifications, Marshes, Enemies Overcome, and along the bottom, Stony Point Carried by Storm, July 15, 1779. The third Congressional Medal awarded for the storming of Stony Point was to Major John Stewart for his extreme courage and vigor in commanding the left advancing party whose path included virtually a vertical ascent towards the fort. He was already famous in the Continental Army for his heroic actions under General Sullivan and the assault on Staten Island. The front of the medal reads, The American Congress to Major John Stewart, an America personified as an Indian queen leaning on the American shield and having had her feet an alligator, presents a palm branch to Major Stewart. The back of the medal reads in Latin, Stony Point assaulted, and it shows Major Stewart at the head of his men crossing a fortification of trees in pursuit of a defeated enemy. In the background, the American troops are mounting to the assault of Stony Point, and six ships are on the Hudson River. The Battle of Paula's Hook was fought in August of 1779 when Major Henry Light Horse Harry Lee launched a nighttime raid on the British-controlled fort in what is today downtown Jersey City. They surprised the British, taking 158 prisoners. Major Lee was rewarded by the Second Continental Congress with a gold medal, the only non-general to receive such an award during the war. front of the medal reads, The American Congress to Henry Lee, Major of Cavalry, and the bust of Major Lee facing to the right. The back of a medal with a crown of laurel is inscribed in Latin, Notwithstanding rivers and ramparts, he conquered with a handful of men, the enemy by skill and valor, and attached by his humanity, those vanquished by his arms. In commemoration of the Battle of Paula's Hook, August 19, 1779. Here's a nice version of Major Light Horse Harry Lee's medal done in pewter. The only naval medal awarded during the Revolution was a gold medal awarded to Captain John Paul Jones, and it was awarded for his capture of the British ship Serapis. And on the front of the medal, it says... The American Congress to Naval Commander John Paul Jones. The reverse of the medal says enemy's vessels taken or put to flight, and it shows the American frigate of 40 guns and the British frigate of 44 guns grappled together, lying head to stern, while the American ship is on fire, her crew are boarding the Serapis, and to the left, a third vessel. 
These are the original dies ordered by Thomas Jefferson from the Royal Engraver Dupree in order to strike over 350 different variations of the medal in bronze, silver, and gold for John Paul Jones' award. Today, the tomb of John Paul Jones is located underneath the chapel of the United States Naval Academy. Get to the medals of the Battle of Cowpens, I thought it would be neat to take a look at the weapons of the American militia and that of the British infantry, and you'll understand why General Morgan just asked for two rounds from his militiamen. One of the things I've always found interesting about the Revolutionary War <clears throat> is the British brown vest musket. A good soldier in the British Army could get off two to three rounds in a minute with the brown vest, but he only had 16 to 18 rounds of ammunition in his cartridge box. Of course, it was pretty simple to use. He just, let's see if I can simply show you. He just pulls out a prepackaged ball and powder, and he would tear it open, dump the ball and the powder and the wad in there, a little powder into the uh, pan here, and he could get a round off. And that's why they only fired a couple of volleys, because the real choice was the charge with the bayonet. And that was something the American soldiers, well, it took a few years for them to get the handle on it. And uh, you'll see why Daniel Morgan only asked for two rounds from his riflemen, then get out of the way and let the Continentals with the muskets and bayonets come up. Okay, all right, we'll take a look now at what's in the rifleman's necessary bag. The American rifleman had a much more accurate weapon, but he also had a bigger challenge when he goes to reload it because he not only had to previously cut patches to start shots, which he had to take from his shot bag, but he also... Morgan's militiamen did not have prepackaged ammunition. They had to take a patch knife and cut, well, patches to go around the ball as they pushed it down the barrel of the rifle. And, of course, they had to select the shot from the shot bag, whether they were going to use different types of shot. And at the same time, they also had to have a different powder charge depending on the distance they were going to fire. And, well, they might even have a second little powder horn for a special powder to go into the pan. So all of that made it a lot more challenging, uh, plus some extra flint. You never stop to think about how important those were. It had a lot more kit, and it was a lot more effort to reload a rifle than it was a musket. The Battle of Cowpens in 1781 was a decisive first step by American forces in reclaiming South Carolina from the British and ultimately turning the tide of the Revolutionary War. The Continental Regiments and Militia Units at Cowpens were led by Brigadier General Daniel Morgan, and he was awarded a gold medal by Congress for his action. The handsome gold medal reads, The American Congress to General Daniel Morgan, and it shows America, personified as an Indian queen, standing and placing her right hand, a crown of laurel upon the head of General Morgan, while her left hand rests on a bow. To the left are seen trophies of the enemy's arms. Against the cannon is the American shield, upon which lies a branch of laurel. To the right is the forest, and it was done by Dupree, the royal engraver, to the king of France. The medal, designed by Augustine Dupree, is considered the finest artistic creation of the entire series of 11 medals. The back of it captures the powerful motion of General Morgan on horseback, leading his troops in the attack of the British forces. And the Latin translates, Victory, the Vindicator of Liberty. At the top and at the bottom of the medal, the enemy put to flight, taken or slain at Cowpens, January 17, 1781. Here's a little better view of the front of the medal showing the Indian princess putting the laurel wreath on the top of Daniel Morgan's head. And I think an easier to see version of the back of the medal where you can see General Morgan leading his troops and the American troops charging forward and the enemy soldiers being dismounted and fleeing. It's really a remarkable piece of work. Lieutenant Colonel William Augustine Washington was awarded a Congressional Silver Medal for his gallantry in leading a decisive cavalry action at the Battle of Cowpens. The front of the medal is inscribed, The American Congress to William Washington, Commander of a Regiment of Cavalry. And it shows Colonel Washington at the head of his men in pursuing the enemy's cavalry. 
A winged victory hovers above him, holding in her right hand a crown of laurel, in her left a palm branch. On the back of the medal, within a crown of laurel, reads, Because in vigorously pursuing the enemy with a handful of soldiers, he gave a noble example of innate courage at the Battle of Calpens, January 17, 1781. Here's a much better view of the beautiful silver medal awarded to Lieutenant Colonel William Washington for his victory at Calpens or his contributions to the victory. Washington was 29 years old at this time. The handsome memorial and tomb at Magnolia Gardens in Charleston, South Carolina. The third medal awarded for Calpens was a silver medal awarded to Lieutenant Colonel John Edgar Howard, who commanded a regiment of infantry and the medal shows him in pursuit of an enemy soldier carrying away a flag. A winged victory hovers over him, holding a crown of laurel and a palm branch. He was 29 years old at the time of the battle and suffered seven sword wounds in the battle. The inscription on the back states, Because in vigorously pursuing the enemy with a handful of soldiers, he gave a noble example of innate courage at the Battle of Calpens, January 17, 1781. Here's a much better picture of Lieutenant Colonel Howard's silver medal. It shows him on horseback pursuing a foot soldier of the enemy who's trying to run away with a standard. A winged victory hovers over him, holding in her right hand a crown of laurel and her left a palm branch. By 1781, General Nathaniel Green had begun a steady push to drive the British out of the South. After a series of battles, General Green's troops attacked the British at their camp in Utah Springs. While both sides claimed victory, it was the final battle for the British in the Carolinas. General Greene's leadership was inspirational. For six years of continuous fighting, during which he did not take a day of leave, and his actions inspired the patriotic forces in Carolinas. His gold medal read, The American Congress to Nathaniel Greene, a distinguished general. The back of the medal reads, The safety of the southern regions. The enemy vanquished at Utah on the 8th of September, 1781. The back of the medal shows winged victory holding a crown of laurel in her right hand and a palm branch in her left. One foot is resting on a trophy of arms and the flags of the conquered enemies. The medal is by the French medalist. In 1787, the medal was finally presented to General Greene's widow, the general having died in 1786. And that brings us to Benjamin Franklin's famous victory medal, or that's what I call it, because when Franklin was stationed in France during the American Revolutionary War, he was sent a detailed after-action report of a Yorktown victory, and he was asked to establish a monument in its honor. Instead, he proposed a medal depicting the United States as an infant in the cradle and strangling two serpents sent by Hera, the snakes representing the Battle of Saratoga and the Siege of Yorktown, and above him, France personified as Athena, or Minerva, acting as his nurse and mentor. Of course, the shield that France is holding is uh, covered with the lilies of France. The Latin inscription on the back of the medal reads, The courageous child was aided by the gods and dated October 1777 to 1781. The front of the medal shows a head of liberty with flowing hair as she's running to announce American victories to the entire world. Records indicate that Franklin had over 300 medals struck in gold, silver, and bronze, many of which he personally presented to celebrate the new republic. The first two gold medals went to the king and queen of France. This was indeed the most famous of the Revolutionary War medals, and when time came to design the Medal of Honor in 1861, it's clear where the designers went for inspiration. Minerva holding a shield banishes discord, the South, who holds two snakes. Even today, the Army's Medal of Honor features a head of Minerva, goddess of war. Perhaps the most unique medal of the Revolution was the Fidelity Medallion, also known as the Andre Capture Medal. It was created specifically by Congress for the three enlisted militiamen, Isaac Van Wart, John Pauling, and David Williams, that captured Major John Andre in September 1780 and was never presented again. It can be considered the oldest decoration in the United States military. The two-sided medal has a Latin inscription which translates as love of country conquers on one side and fidelity on the other. <laughs> the nice thing about this, the three enlisted men also got annual pensions. British Major Andre was not so lucky.
Final Medal of the Revolution was the Purple Heart, the first United States military decoration instituted by General George Washington in 1782 and awarded for bravery in action. The record show that only three men received it during the American Revolution, all of them non-commissioned officers. The original Purple Heart medal was sewed onto the coat and was simply a purple heart-shaped piece of cloth edged with silver braid. And although this was the Medal of Honor of the Revolution, it seems to have been forgotten for about 150 years. The 200th anniversary of Washington's birth marked the revival of the Purple Heart in February 1932. Thanks for watching today. I hope you enjoyed this show on the medals of the revolution. It's pretty interesting. And some of those are beautiful, beautiful medals you'll never see anywhere else. Especially that uh, diamond encrusted eagle for George Washington. Pretty cool, huh? 200 diamonds, rubies, and emeralds in that one. Uh, also, I thought you might find it interesting what went in the cartridge box of the British soldier in the revolution and what went in the necessary bag of the American rifleman. And if you enjoyed these, please give us a thumbs up. Even better, subscribe. It'll keep us on the air. All of the information that you saw today came from our book, Military Medals of America, which is available for you on Amazon. It's just a click away, and you can have it all right at your fingertips, plus everything up to the global war on terror. Okay, see you next time on Veterans Medals Workshop.